Jesus, hallelujah. I want to get into the Word today. I, um, I'll be honest with you, I know I tell you a lot of times that I don't, I'm not going to be very long, but I can't tell you that today. Um, because this may be a little bit longer. And y'all are thinking right now, oh Lord, I shouldn't have put them beans on the stove. You knew better. You knew I'm a long-winded preacher. No, it, uh, but I, I do, uh, the Lord's really given me something that I, I want to share with you, and it's nothing that we don't know, but sometimes we have to just go back and be reminded. This is what God put on my heart today, so this is where we have to go. I, I don't read out of a, a book. I don't order sermons online. Um, I'm not going to read you a message. I'm going to read from the Word of God, and, uh, and we're going to let God minister today. We're going to be in the book of Second Kings, the 22nd chapter. 2 Kings 22. Now, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, so if you're in a King James, you'll notice it's just a little bit, some of the stuff's different, but I like the New King James because they take a few of the these and thous out, but it leaves the, the heart of the Word just as it is. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter. We'll start in verse 3. And again, if you're able to stand, you're welcome. We encourage you to stand, forgive, honor the Word of God. And if you are, are one of our seniors, please do not feel obligated to get up uh, because, man, man, I'll have you up and down sometimes. And it, uh, uh, But it, when we're able, we try to always give reverence to God's Word. Second Kings 22, starting in verse 3, says, Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the, pre the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people, and let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages. If you're in the King James, it says the breaches. To repair the damages... Uh, of the house uh, to carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. Verse 8 says, Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book. Look at your neighbor and say the book. Hallelujah. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word and saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, whose oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. Then Shaphan read it before the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, uh, Ahikiam, the son of Shaphan, Achor, the son of Micaiah, uh, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that has aroused against us. Because our fathers, look at your neighbor and say, our fathers. Because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Let us pray. Father, I thank you again for your word again today. God, I thank you for your blessings and your anointing. Lord, and again, uh, I stand here empty, Lord, without you. Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that you will speak through me today, God, as a mouthpiece. Lord, let your word come forth and every word come from you. Lord, I ask you, Father, to help me, Lord, to not speak of myself today, God, Lord, but for you to speak that your people will be blessed and strengthened and encouraged, that lives are changed. Lord, that we can be pleasing unto you, Lord. And I, I pray today, Father, Lord, have your way today, Lord. I can do nothing on my own. All glory goes to you, Lord, and we give you all praise, honor, and glory in your beautiful name, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Reading here uh, in 2 Kings, uh, we find, and a lot of you may know the story of Josiah. It's a, it's a pretty powerful story. And you begin to look and we find here that the house of God uh, was obviously in need of some repair. 
the king is, is said, hey, I want you to go and take the money. And they used to, uh, according to uh, history, they would have these boxes that basically had like a, you know, kind of like we still do today, almost like a ballot box. They could put the money in and it was locked and it would go and it would build and build and build. And there would come a certain point to where uh, the priest, when it was time, they would take the money and it was used for whatever was needed uh, in the house of the Lord. And we find that the king has obviously been looking at the house of God. We, we know that he obviously has been examining and looking and he's seeing some things in disrepair. He, he realizes there's some things that need to be done. And uh, as a good king, he's, he says, you know what, it's time. He, he sent his servant down. He said, I want you to go send word to the, uh, to the priest. Go tell Hilkiah to, to take the money and I want him to count it. And once he counts it and figures out how much is in there, then I want him to take the money and I want him to go to those that uh, are the builders, the construction guys. And these are faithful guys. They've been working on the house of God. There wasn't an issue with money. I want to point that out. There wasn't an issue in the house of God with money. That wasn't the problem. Wasn't a problem with money coming into the house of God. The money was there. Wasn't a problem with the money uh, disappearing. It was in the boxes. Wasn't a problem with the people that were repairing the house, he says, because they deal faithfully. Don't even worry about the accounting. Basically he's saying, just give them an open check. Hand them the money and tell them, get everything done that I need to get done. Get all the wood done, all the everything, get it fixed. This is the house of God. <clears throat> Why? Because the king was trying to take care of God's house. I, I want to take us down a little path before I get to where I'm actually going. I want us to look and, and get a, a good understanding that most of what I'm going to talk about today is not about what's outside of the house of God. It's about what's in the house of God. It's not about what's down the street. It's not about what's down at the bar or down at the club or down at the strip joint or all these places, the, the dope joint. All the, I'm not talking. I'm talking about the house of God today. <clears throat> we find that the, uh, he delivers it, but when he goes down there to give this word to him, to tell him what to do, then the priest says, I found something. They're in the midst of this construction. He said, I found something. He said, now I need to show it to you. And, and the priest takes the Shaphan and he gives him the book. And as Shaphan takes the book and he begins to read and read what's inside of the pages, all of a sudden, he's like, this is something I think we need to show the king. Now I noticed that Hilkiah said, he called it the book. But Shaphan called it a book. See, sometimes people don't understand the importance of what is in my hand right here. Sometimes people don't understand just how important, and you can call it the book because it's the word of God. It's, it's the uh, uh, very instructions for eternal life and also for damnation. It's the same instructions that tell us how to not only get to heaven, but how to not go to hell. How to please God and how to basically not. So it's a big difference in the book and a book. If you look around, there's a lot of books. But there's only one the book. So Shaphan brings the book and, and he begins to uh, uh, come to the king and he tells the king, he says, King, I've done what you've asked. I've, I've brought the money, uh, uh, everything that to the, you know, we've got it counted. He'll kind of count the money. We had probably X amount of dollars. I imagine that doesn't say that he said that, but I'm thinking, he's like, yeah, we did pretty good. There's plenty of money in the account. We've already given it to the guys doing the work. Construction has started, king. But. But what? Well, Hilkiah found this book, and he seemed pretty determined that I need to show it to you. I found a book here, and well, here it is, king, and I imagine it doesn't say it this way. Y'all know I like to kind of fill in the blanks. I imagine the king said, well, well you're right there, just read it to me. He's the king. Shaphan begins to read the words in the book. Where was this book at? This book was in the house of God. And it was lost. Hilkiah found this book in the house of God. And it was lost. And you think I need... Well, just read it to me. So as he began to read the book. As he began to read the book, he began to find out the instructions. He began to find out the trouble they were in. Because the more he read the king began to realize how far from God that not only him, but the land that he served was in. I can't quite grasp in my mind at, at what point 
did the book get lost in the house of God? At what point do people come in week after week after week after week and put money in that little box that they had out front? At what point did, did, did they stop reverencing the book as a book? Because see, I can tell you right now, there's a lot of books on a lot of these pews, and I have no idea what most of them are. I mean, I, they're not important to me. I, I'm, I've seen many times, I've been here for years, I've went up and down these, these pews many a times, I've, I, I've cleaned in here, we have done many things, seeing lots of books. But I can promise you this, I know where this book is at all times. Because this is an important book to me. This is, this is the book. This is the word of God. This is, this is the only way that I'm going to find what God is pleased by and what he's not. So I begin to think, my Lord, how did not only this king, but the whole land and the house of God, they thought it was in disrepair with the construction, had no idea the, the damage was so much greater than the paint on the walls and the stones out of place and the, the wood that was rotten. There was a rotting inside that was much worse than wood. Because they had the book the whole time. The people had been accountable to what was in the pages of the book the whole time. See, I can tell you right now that the house of God is a place of reverence. It's a, it's, a, it's a reason why we, we treat the sanctuary as a, this is not just any place. There's a, there's a reason why we eat in the back and not in here. There's a reason why we, we reverence and, and we look at the front of the church, the house of God, and this is our, our altar in the front. There's a reason why when we, we you know, yeah, I may walk here, but it's, a, it's certain times when it's altar time that this becomes sacred. Because it's dedicated under the one that controls your next breath. The one that controls the place where you're going to spend eternity from here forward. How did they lose such a precious item in the house of God? Hallelujah. I tell you, I believe, Brother Bill, if I, if I was to just take a little liberty with this story, I, I believe it didn't happen instantly. I don't think it happened overnight. I think somewhere down the line there were some priests and men of God that were faithful, they were doing the right thing. But see, sometimes generations go by, and sometimes people get older and they change. But a lot of times generations change, and the next one comes along. He may not be quite as dedicated, and the next one comes along. and At some point, people start living by feelings, and what they think instead of what it says. Because see, sometimes we have things in our life and the situations and, and where we're living and how we're living and what we're doing. And we say, well, I don't think God will mind this. But then we open up the book and it's like, ooh. And then people start saying, well, I just don't think. Sister Barbara, everything is not. God don't mean it all literally. It don't all mean just that. Now what you're doing, he means what, against what you do. But this little thing, it's not, God, God's not going to send me to hell for that. That's how they lost the book. Somebody got, got tired of feeling the ooze ooch, and the ouches. Somebody got tired of the, the word of God uh, hitting them and hurting them. And they wanted to live the way they wanted to live. And they wanted to be uh, controlled by the lust of their own flesh instead of the word of God. They didn't want to line out with what the word of God says. Because it ain't easy. If you don't fall in love with God and completely sell out to Him with your whole heart, can I tell you, you won't live by this book. That's why the Bible says it's straight as the way and narrow is the gate and very few that's going to find their way into heaven. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. It tells us that hell had enlarged itself because so many people's going. Why? Because there's a lot of churches, they've lost the book. They've quit preaching on sin. They quit preaching about deliverance and they're preaching for an offering. They're preaching for a bigger car and a bigger house and a bigger church. Let us have one service. No, no, let us have two service. No, let's have three service. Let me just keep building my kingdom. That's what happened in the house of God. That's what happened when somehow or another that they begin to lose sight. But do you know what is really the sad part? Is I look at what was said, said, what was said. Y'all know I'm a little hillbilly sometimes. I got to reel that back in. 
you look at what was said. He said, he said, I'm worried about the wrath of God for what? What our fathers have done. See, some of us have been born into this thing and we have, we have uh, had generation after generation of people that only choose what they want out of the Word of God. And some of us have been born into these things. And we've heard grandma and we've heard mom and dad and we've heard preacher after preacher and organization after organization. They, they hit the highlights of certain things, what they call bad. Y'all knew I, I grew up when I was little. I, I started off in, in the Baptist church, you know. Man, it was, we were, it was, it was wonderful. Mom and dad started going to a Pentecostal church, and I had a great time there. But I, I discovered that they looked at the word differently. And a lot of the people where I grew up, they judged people so hard on what they put on. They're reading the same book. I've, I've watched a man one time, I seen a young boy come to an altar crying tears down his face and he had an eyebrow piercing on and a piercing in his nose and one in his tongue and one of the people from the back of the church, one of the, the, the elders of the church literally come down and rebuked us for praying with him until he took those things out. Can you believe such? Never give the young man a chance. He never came back. You humiliated him. His brother went to the church faithful, had been praying for him. And he never got a chance to fall in love with Jesus because somebody went by what they were feeling instead of what the Word of God says. Too many times and too often uh, we are in a world right now where people, they're, they're not going by what the Word of God says. They don't understand really what the mission and the commission of Jesus for you and I are. It ain't about us. It ain't about us. We are here with one purpose and a mission. We are pilgrims passing through. This is not our home. We are not set to uh, designed to set up shop here to where everything is about us, but we're supposed to just get by long enough until we can make heaven our home, but we're not supposed to go alone. Hallelujah. Josiah, King Josiah begins to hear the word that come forth, and he is so upset. The king in his beautiful robe, he began to tear and rip off his, his, his royal garment. Why? Because he realized, you know what? It's time for this big old boy right here to be humble. Because the reality was, is he knew that God was real. Most people know that God is real. They know that there is a real wrath of God. They know that there is heaven to be a place to go to. Most of us down inside, even the greatest sinners, when things get bad, they will ask God for help even at times. Because down inside, we know God's real. But oh, what happens when our fathers and those that have led us astray, and they've, they've taught us the highlights, and they've, they've taught us the, the pieces of the Word of God that, that makes them or their organization be a certain way. That, there's a reason why we have non-denomination. on the. I don't want anyone to say there's a preconceived notion of what we believe. We believe in this Word of God, this book right here. I believe every page from front to, front to back. If it, if it says that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, I believe it. If it tells me he was swallowed by a catfish, I believe it. If it tells me he was swallowed by a minnow, I believe it. You don't think God can't make a minnow's mouth swell? He can. He can do it. So when I read in the Word of God, the Bible says to seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I realize it ain't time to, to, to treat this book like it's some just some a book. This ain't a book. It's the book. We've, we've converted our Bible. And y'all know I'm guilty. I, I use a tablet. I make my notes. I, a lot of times I read my Bible out of, out of electronics. I think we have, we have turned the Bible into just another app. Just another link on our phone. We've lost the reverence to the Word of God and realizes that its importance and its strength and its structure. Realizing that, that our lives that we live, it's not about what I think. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and and they want to tell me all the good things they've done. Well, I go to church every week. Been, I've been putting money in the plate my whole life. I know that you tithe them to the Lord. That's great. That's fantastic. God will bless you for it. Can I tell you that there's heathens in the world that give more than 
They do it for a tax write-off, but God will still bless them because his word of God is forever settled. It cannot be a lie. And whoever obeys and you give unto God, he will bless you. Don't mean they're going to heaven. All dogs ain't going to heaven, y'all. Everybody's not going. We don't like to think about that. We have been we have been told that same lie for how long? Why? Because people have got away from the book. Because nobody likes to come to a church where the preacher starts telling you the truth. The Bible even tells us that in the last days that people will seek out those preachers and teachers having itching ears, wanting us to scratch their ears and tell them what they want to hear. But I'm in danger. Because I'm the watchman on the wall and God has called me to such a time as this to be truthful and with love to tell you it's time to realize that this is the book. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to you on this today on this thought. What happened to the book? What happened to to the book. Uh, What has happened, I remember growing up and I remember we had one of those real big Bibles. Uh, There was one that was out here for the longest. I'm not sure where it went. I think it's up underneath there. Uh, I think it got moved in a funeral. But we called them coffee table Bibles. You know what I mean? The real big, we had one when I was a kid. And you know what? I was not allowed to touch it. Because it also sit on the coffee table in the main living room that I was not allowed to touch. Right in front of the couch wrapped in plastic that I was not allowed to sit on. It become part of the furniture. And we didn't reverence it as the book when I was that little. And understanding, it was it was nice, it was expensive. It wasn't I had a Bible, a little Bible. But we got a reverence that it's not just a piece of furniture. It's not just a book in our life. When we make it a book, it begins to lose its place. It begins to lose its power. It begins to lose what it should be. It's not about a book. It's about being the book in your life. So I ask you, what's happened to the book? What's happened to the words and the pages in your life? What is it that we compromise on in the things that, I mean, you know, if we're going to be real, Josiah, what did he get so upset about that he tore his clothes? That he ripped everything. What was he so worried about? He said, I need you to immediately go and, and, and go to the, the, the house. Find out for me. Seek, inquire of those, that, the prophets of, of what's going on. Because I've realized. And he sent all these men of God down. And they went to the prophetess. And, and they said, that we've been sent to find out about what's going on. And what the Lord will do. And she said, the one that sent you, the king. The Lord, will, you tell him just like this. Thus saith the Lord. Ooh, thank God for somebody that can prophesy. And it actually be of God. See, there's so many people want to claim to be a prophet and apostle and this and that. And they're self-proclaimed and, and God ain't spoke to them ever. They done had too much baloney yesterday. A little indigestion. They think the Lord's speaking to them. Thank God for someone actually in the midst of turmoil and, and chaos. Hear from the word of God. They should have had that person in there keeping up with the book. And she said, you go and tell the king. That thus says the word of the Lord, thus says God. That because I have seen the humbleness in you and I've seen your heart, how you turn, you tore your clothes in repentance, that all the judgments that's coming forth, there is a wrath that's coming. But you're not going to see it in his days. It's not going to happen to you and to, and to your days. You're going to live. You're going to be king. And they took that word back to the king and the king. You know what he did? He said, praise Jesus. And he began to set himself on a mission of change. I can preach this message to you and you can go home and say, my Lord, Brother Joe preached a great message. I go on and pat myself on the back right now. Good job. He preached a message today. But if we're receiving the message and, and, and you get a word of God that we are under grace, if you don't do what Josiah did, the message is in vain in your household. Hallelujah. Let me jump down here. Scripture. 2 Kings 23, verse 1. It says, now the king sent them to go after the elder. We we covered that already. I talked about it. It went down and uh, uh, he heard the word from the the prophetess. It told him that the Lord was going to let everything be okay in his household. It says, then the king stood by a pillar. He made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord. 
and to keep his commandments and his, his, his testimonies. So let me back up just a little bit. I'm about to, I, I did miss part of this. I apologize. Now the king sent to them, verse 1, to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book, of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. It had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. I mean, he made a declaration. He made a promise. He, he made an oath to God. However you want to look at it, I'm encouraging you when you hear this word and you begin to look, and, and we're going to cover some of the things that he's seen happening. When you begin to examine your life, if you turn the searchlight on the inside, and if you find that if the Lord was to come right now, right now, if there's things in your life you'd be ashamed of for the Lord to know that's in your life that you don't have under the blood, then I want you to make a covenant with God that I have found the book, Lord, and I have, I have realized your truth and that your grace is not a ticket, but it's an opportunity for me while I'm living and breathing to get things right. And thank you, God, for this grace that I can ask you for forgiveness, and Lord, you will forgive me. And Lord, forgive me for every sin. Lord, forgive me of what I've done. And help me, God, to serve you fervently. And let me not forget your words. And let it not be about me and what I think. But let me study your word diligently and seek out my salvation with fear and trembling. And not just believe what my forefathers have told me. So that's a mouthful. Then the king stood by the pillar, made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. I ask you, what does doing something with all your heart and all your soul look like? I could tell you what it was for me. Most of y'all know our story, Miss Sister Emma, we met in a bar. I was a drug dealer. She didn't know it. She was drinking. I was doing all these things. And we got to talking about Jesus. And we got to going on. And I told her I knew that if I died, I wouldn't go to heaven because of the life I was living. And we made that declaration and, and going on. I'm like, I'm not going to be a hypocrite before the Lord. And she said, well, let's just serve God. And I'm like, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to be. When I serve God, it'll be all the way. I was making a declaration. I'm not going to be in this bar anymore. I'm not going to get high no more. I'm not going to be drinking. I'm, there's, there's some things I'm going to change if I'm going to serve God. I've seen hypocrisy my whole life. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? You, you've seen ministry be hypocrisy. You've seen people be hypocrites. They, they profess one thing but do another. I've had more than enough of that in my lifetime. I didn't need to become what I had already almost hated most of my life. And I made a declaration and you know what Sister Emma said? Y'all know. She said, let's do it. Saturday night, we made a, I said, you want to go to church with me tomorrow? She said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll pick you up. And we went to church the next day. And y'all know the story. Man, the preacher got to preaching an altar call, and I'm sitting there white knuckling in the pew, and I opened up my eye. I had them closed. And I look, and she's gone. I look down at the altar, and she's down in the altar. She's, she's down there weeping before the Lord. And I followed. And that was the beginning of our journey. That was the beginning of God answering a, a, a beautiful thing. And that was where the Lord began to change. We made a declaration of change in our life. Was we perfect? No. But we started a journey. And we decided, I'm not going to be who I used to be. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. We made a declaration. And we started this work. We started what God was doing. I, I told her, I said, I don't want to do anything but just go to church. I just want to sit on a pew. But the Lord said, no, that's not it. I got more for you to do, boy. Quit being lazy. Quit being fearful. And we're not perfect. But I can tell you one thing. I'm not like I used to be. Hallelujah. And the king commanded, I'm going to tell you what it looks like to have change. Josiah, he made a change. On verse 4, it says, And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, uh, the priest of the second order of the doorkeepers to bring out of bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal and Asherah. False gods in the house of... How did they get these things in the house of God? At what point? Because when the book, Brother Bill, you said it, when the book got lost 
And people started going by what they feel. It felt, well, it, well we want to make room for everybody. Well, everybody's welcome. And whatever you believe, oh, you, you worship Baal? Well, okay. Well, you just come on and bring Baal with you. You come on, bring Buddha. You come on, bring whoever. We'll just put them all in. Asher, the, 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 the god of the forest, you want to worship? Well, just come on. We're going to worship. That's what they did. Are we not in that same time right now? Yeah. Is people not uh, bypassing sin and say, well, whatever you live, whatever you believe, well, we just welcome everybody. Come on, let's all coexist and let's all be fine. It's in the book. It's happened before. And when Josiah realized where they were at, he was like, oh, my God. The wrath of God is about to fall out. Can I tell you that we're under grace right now? Thank God that Jesus come and give us grace. We're not under instant judgment, but I want you to understand something. The wrath is coming. There's a price for the sin that was paid. There's a price for the beatings upon the Son of God. There's a price for the, uh, the cruelty and the abuse, the spitting upon, the mocking, the blood that run down. There's a price for what was done to our Savior. And you'll either trample the blood of Jesus or you'll be washed in it. Hallelujah. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest. They brought all this junk out of the house of God. Hallelujah. And burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. They burned it. There's some things in our life that we need to not only get out of our life, but we need to burn it and destroy it so that we never go back to it again. Verse 5, that was the first thing. You think that was enough? Then he removed the idolatrous priest whom the king of Judah had ordained to burn incense into the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem. And those who burned incense to Baal and to the sun and to the moon and to the constellations and to all the host of heaven. Just bring everybody in, all of y'all, you Wiccans. We're just going to, everybody's, we all going to just serve God together. That ain't the book. Are we going to love everybody? Of course. I'm going to preach love to everybody. And I'm going to tell everybody. I'm not going to tell you you're just going to heaven just like you are. You ain't got to change. Bless your little heart. I'm going to tell you you're under the same thing as me. Where the tree falls, that's where you lay. If you die in sin, there's coming a time when the book will be opened and you'll be judged by where the tree fell, by what you've done. Hallelujah. They brought all these things. It gets, it gets, it's amazing how far. Uh, verse 6, five's not enough. What did he do in verse 6? And then he brought out the wooden images from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it at the brook Kidron, and ground it to ashes and threw the ashes on the graves of the common people. Now this is the one that's really going to, verse 7. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord. What? The perverted ritual booths. That almost sounds like some stuff that's been in the news not too long ago. Some of these places, some perverted folks dealing with little boys. and It happened all the way back in King Josiah's day. In the house of the Lord. Why? Because they treated it like a book and not the book. What has happened to the book in their life and generation? They lost fear. They lost reverence. They treated it as a, not the and took the, the, where the women uh, wore, uh, wove hangings for the wooden image. He brought out all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. Also, he broke down the high places in the gates uh, which were at the entrance of the gate of Josiah, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high place did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. Can I tell you, even in the midst of all this nonsense, God still had some people doing it right. He will always have a people... There will always be people that will stand in the face of adversity and no matter how everybody else is doing it wrong, there's always going to be a people that are still holding on to what's real. Verse 10, he defiled Topheth, uh, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon, that no man might t make his sons or daughters pass through the fire of Molech. Can you believe all this was happening to a godly nation? This was all happening under the godly rule. Why? Everything goes and it gets deeper. Everybody's accepted. Everybody, that's what they want. That's the same thing the enemy's trying to do in our generation. Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord in the chamber of Nathan, Melech, and the uh, officer who was in the court. And he burned the chariots of the sun with fire, the altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, 
which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which uh, Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Over and over, it's in the house of the Lord. The king broke down the pulp and, and pulverized there and threw the dust into the brook Kidron. Verse 13, was that enough? No. Then the king defiled the high places and, uh, that were in the east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount Corruption. There's a reason why he's being so specific. And he, he showed us he didn't leave nothing. He wasn't leaving nothing to chance. He said, I got an opportunity to escape the wrath of God, and I am burning everything that God don't like. I'm getting rid of everything out of not only my life but my kingdom because I have been given grace. I have been given a second chance, and I can't take a chance on losing it. Somebody might wonder why I like to praise God the way I do. Why I sing hallelujah to the Lord and I give him my praise. Somebody might wonder why I'm so enthusiastic about the Lord. Because, Brother Bill, I'm so excited about my second chance. I can't take a chance. Just Jackie, I can't take a chance. I got to give him my all. Hallelujah. The king of Israel had built Ashtoreth, the abomination of the uh, Sidonians for uh, Chemish, the abomination of the Moabites, the Milcom, and the abomination of the people of Amnon. And he broke in uh, pieces the sacred pillars and cut them down the wooden, wooden images and filled the places of bones of men, with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar, verse 15, again, uh, that was in, at Bethel. Bethel was considered the house of God. You look it up, you find it was noted as the house of God at the altar that was at Bethel in the high places, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made uh, Israel sin, had made both the altar and the high place, he broke it down and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and the burned the wooden image. And Josiah turned and saw the tombs. Oh, you mean he done burned all this stuff that's new? And then he looked and he's like, who's buried over there? Now I'm going to go and tell you right now, y'all know I'm sweating, I'm preaching hard. Somebody right now is going... Josiah was a fanatic. He's just too fanatical. Some people look at me sometimes, they think, man, you too, you too spiritually minded to be any earthly good. Somebody wants to talk to me, I don't want to talk about things of the world. I don't want to, I don't want to hear about nonsense. I don't want to hear no dirty jokes. Don't, don't, don't tell. Sometimes I have to stop people. They start something, they want to tell me, I say, whoop, 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 whoop. is this a dirty joke? Well, it ain't that dirty. I don't want to hear it. Well, it ain't that bad. Nope, sorry. I don't want that nonsense in my ears. Why? Because I'm seeking out my salvation with fear and trembling. I don't want to hear no junk and no garbage. I don't want to be falling into the traps of the enemy. I, I don't want to let the books just go from in the front of me. To this. Well, it's not. You just put the Lord. He won't. He, he's not listening right now. Let's just. That ain't how God works. That's foolishness. Hallelujah. Josiah saw the tombs. I'm, I'm hurrying. I'm trying to read fast on the mountain. And he uh, sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of God. Why? Because they had been worshiping false gods. They had been teaching false doctrines. The fathers of people, they're, he said, we are, I can't take a chance. I'm not giving no reverence, no honor. I'm not having these tombs that are set up as monuments under these people that everyone thought was so great. When I realized just what they've been doing, I got to cut that out. There's some people in our lives that we have looked and we thought so great and high of, and, and, and we, man, they just be these great people. And then all of a sudden, we really get to realizing that, man, they've been lying to me. They've been deceiving. They've been. Can I just tell you that if someone tells you all you got to do is believe and that you're signed, sealed, and delivered, can I tell you that's not in the book? But I was told that. Now, you do have to believe to start. you got to believe. That's part of it. But see, we also got to act on our belief, and we got to build a relationship, and we got to separate from sin. And we have to. The Bible says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the living God. He who defiles the temple, he'll what? Destroy the soul. 
We've been called to be a royal priesthood of different people are separated. I'm not talking about the length of your skirt. I'm not talking about the length of your sleeve. I'm talking about the on the inside, that spiritual man that it allows to become the reflection of Christ in loving people and being kind and, and, and turning away from evil, not allowing things to be fed into you, turning and doing what God would be pleased with. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. I'm trying to hurry. He, he burned them, brought them to powder, powder. Come across a man of God that was buried. And they, he said, leave them alone. Don't mess with the man of God. Verse 17, don't mess with the man of God's uh, bones. He reverenced him. Verse 19, and Josiah took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the king of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger. Did according to all these deeds. Verse 20, uh, he executed all the priests of the high places which were there on the altars and burned the men's bones on them. And he returned them, returned to Jerusalem. Verse 21 says, then the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover of the Lord your God as it is written in the book of the covenant. And, and this is verse 22 is powerful. I want to slow down for a moment here. It says, And such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, the Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Now see, the Passover was a sacred thing to the children of Israel. That was, the, that was the, when they were delivered out of, of Egypt. That, that, that's the beginning of, of, of this. This is a sacred thing. They had continued. They had been doing a Passover. But it said never hadn't been one like this one since the beginning. You know why? Because they cleaned up their act. They got all the things that they weren't supposed to be doing, all the things that displeased God out of their life, so that when they had that Passover, they were truly thankful. They understood that the wrath of... They didn't realize. Some of them didn't know because this is what they've been taught since they've been born. This is what the, the, the preacher's been telling me. This is what the priest has been telling me. Uh, they've been doing these things. They've been having all these different gods. I've been worshiping the... I've been doing all these things wrong, and I didn't know. But can I tell you something? Ignorance is not bliss. The wrath was coming on them and their children, and it still came later. But because of the change and the humility and the humbleness, God gave another chance to a people. Because after Josiah, the next king was not a king that served God. And they went back to leading astray. You may be the only one in your family that's leading the way. You may be the only trailblazer that's going to go against the grain. And you're going to share the love of Jesus and tell about the kindness and the goodness of God. You may be the only one that has the reputation of a peacemaker and, and, and love of God. And the next generation may not want God at all, but can I tell you that if you, if you snatch one soul out of the depths of hell, if you, just, if you just get one person to change, you have been doing the work of God. But woe unto those that don't care. Woe unto those that continue in sin. Woe unto those that when the book is found, they make no change. Hallelujah. Moreover, Josiah put all, away all the... Uh, those who consulted with mediums and spirits and spiritualists, the household gods and idols and the abominations that were in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book of Hilkiah, the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now, there, now before there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and with all his might. How do you turn to God with all your heart, your soul, and your might? You do just what he did. You get rid of everything displeasing to God, even the things that you think might be displeasing. i just be honest. Somebody that was already buried in the shrine, I mean, I think maybe that's a little overkill. You're going to pull up their bones and burn them and turn them to powder. Josiah said, I'm not leaving nothing to chance. In church, I can't leave nothing to chance. You can't leave nothing to chance. Because the devil, he's been out there trying to kill, steal, and destroy for years. He's been lying to us. And we know that the Bible says our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't trust your heart because the thoughts that, that God also speaks to you on. I heard, I believe it was Brother Andy Stanley this morning. Let's still mention. He, he said the thoughts in your head that God speaks to you on, not just the Lord speaks, but the enemy wants to speak into your mind. 
Every time the enemy tries to bring confusion and division and, and strife and envy and all these things. That's what Brother Stanley was preaching on this morning. He said the enemy's put those thoughts there. The same place where the, that's why the Bible said that we have to gird up the loins of our mind so that when things come in that we know is, is, is not of God, we have to say, no, sir, devil, not in here. This is dedicated. This temple in between my two uh, uh, temples here, this mind of mine, this is going to be given to God to see lives changed, to see souls won. I'm not letting you speak that nonsense into my head. Why? Because I'm burning down everything, every idol, everything the enemy, every seed he's planted. Romans 1 and 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Uh-oh, this is New Testament. You done messed up, Brother Joe. You got out of the Old Testament and got in the New Testament. You're trying to prove a point. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppresses the truth and unrighteousness because it may be known of God is meant because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? Without excuse. We are without excuse because we see, we know God is real. We know there's a, there is a price to be paid. And Jesus paid the price for you and I. So what do we have to do? We have to lay down our life. We die daily unto the Lord. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. We have made God into a fairy tale. We think he's like one of the Avengers. Oh, he just, oh, he, but that's not, I got news for you. God ain't no Avenger. He's not, he's not, he's not like Iron Man. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He deserves honor, reverence, and glory. And we live in a time when no one honors anyone and reverences anyone. But authority has been uh, looked at and mocked. But the Lord is of all authority. Hallelujah. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 12 and 11, it says, And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day and not in revelry, revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. That's New Testament, y'all. Oh, man, don't that hurt? But it gets better. Revelations 20, verse 11, it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the book, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. See, it ain't about what you just believe, and it's about what you do with what you believe. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There is a wrath that's coming. And those that have not made themselves ready, those who have not put on the bride garment, the bride uh, uh, attire to be spotless in, in a white garment for the Lord. How do you do that? It's through the blood of Jesus. It's through dedicating unto Him a relationship with Him. It's not enough to say I do. If I never have a relationship with my wife, even though we're legally married, and we got a little certificate that says so. But I assure you, if I don't tell her I love her, if I don't put my arms around her every now and then and, and, and just, you know, daily have to build that relationship, can I tell you the first thing that will happen? My sweetie will say, hey, you've been awful busy. We need some time to be together. I miss you. 
Say, so you say that like it's happened. Yeah, it's happened because I wear a lot of hats. I own a business. I'm full-time in my business. I'm full-time pastoring. We have grandkids. We have things going on. We've done prison ministry. And it don't take long. You physically get tired. You mentally get tired. And you know what happens? You sometimes forget what the most important thing is. And that's when I come home to not treat her like she's just my partner, but that she's my bride and my love. And it's the same way with God. We get busy going to work, and we get busy coming to church. We get busy having church events and doing things for God. And sometimes there's turmoil in the church and all these things, and the devil wants to get us caught in the midst and get us off of the fact that we need to come and put a little arm around our love. I, I love in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where it talks about Jesus being the lover of his soul. And, and have you seen my lover? As the, as the word talks about, he began to seek for his love. Sometimes we have to take Jesus that way and we get alone. It's not about all the hoopla, but sometimes you get alone and you, you just make sure that you, in that, you get all cleaned up. You know, I, I, let's just be real. When you have a married couple, sometimes you have times you come together and it's a beautiful thing, but I don't come together all sweaty from work. I, I get in the shower, I get cleaned up, and me and Mama go out to dinner. We go maybe see a movie. We spend some time, but I, she don't want me all stinky and funky. I get cleaned up. Same way with Jesus. He wants us to come before him. If there's some things that's gotten messed up this week and we've made some mistakes, we come to him and say, Lord, forgive me, Jesus. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done. Forgive me what I said, Lord, and help me, God, to make changes. God, I, I, did, I know I shouldn't have did this. I shouldn't have done that. Or I, I should have done this. Or I should have done that. And Lord, forgive me. You know I love you. You know what we're doing? We're getting cleaned up. We're building that relationship. We're getting that intimacy with God. That's what he wants from you. The world says all you got to do is just Oh, you got it covered. You believe. Just go on and do your thing, man. Sit up all night. Watch TV. Let, do whatever, man. Let's go. Let's go. Have a good time. And all the time, the Lord is going, hey, I've been waiting on you. I need you. Hallelujah. I'm talking about real love. Hallelujah. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he that dwell with them. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and, their, and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There should be no pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirst. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. He who overcomes sin, overcomes problems, overcome the enemy, shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God, is, give us a beautiful, beautiful way of escape. We, no one is, in, he does not want anyone to go to hell. Jesus come and went through the cross so that, that we would not have to pay for the price of sin that our fathers committed that we could get forgiveness. I don't care what you was taught from the moment you grew up. I don't care what the preacher said. I don't care what the evangelist said, what grandma said, mama said. I'm encouraging you to read this book for yourself and to search out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't look through the eyes of someone else, but look brand new into the Word of God and say, Lord, what does it all mean to me? I promise you, as you begin to dig through His Word, you could dig through the New Testament if you just want to read. Uh, the, if you just want to read the New, read what Jesus tells you. He come against the religious people and He put His arms around those that were broken, those that were less fortunate, those that were in need. He said, "I come after those that was in need of a physician." See, when we come to the Lord, our, our, our business in the church is not to just be having church. Our business is to go to the broken, go to the needy, go to the prisons, go to these places so that we have fruit. Come on, everybody, stand if you're able. Those that are not, please remain seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of change. Today is the day that the Lord has spoke to you. And God has given you the thus saith the Lord in your life. Say, are you prophesying to me? I'm just reading you the word of God. And the word of God says, if you will repent.
and ask God to forgive you. The Word of God says He will. If you will obey Him, you'll be baptized in His name. God will put His Spirit in you. Oh, man, can I tell you, He wants to change your life. He wants you to not be like I was, backslid. He wants you to be all together. I look in the book of Revelations. There's a place that says if you're lukewarm, He will spew you from His mouth. He don't want you to be. He said, I wish that you was hot or that you were cold. He don't want us to be just going through the motions. He wants you to be on fire for God. Because if you're cold, there's hope. But when you're lukewarm, you say, Ah, I just don't believe that preacher. I don't think all that's necessary. I don't think all this. That ain't what granddad and grandma, and that's what ain't what they've been doing all these years. I don't care what everybody else has done. You have a personal walk with Jesus. You have a personal relationship with Jesus like me. And the Lord is waiting to hear the words, Lord, please forgive me. Change me. Wash me. Lord, make me new. Help me to change my habits. Help me to change my ways. Help me to burn those things from my past that I no longer go back to them. As we begin to pray, can I encourage you to talk to God? There's some things you need to get right with God. Can I encourage you to get them right? Right now, make them right. Don't, don't leave here with these burdens. So you've been going a long time today, Pastor. I have because this is important. The altars are open. If you feel you want to come down and kneel down, you're welcome to come and kneel and pray. If you need to pray right where you're standing or where you're sitting, you can do whatever needs to be done. But today, the Lord has given you another opportunity of grace. And the book has been opened to you. And the reality is, is that sin's not going to heaven. We have to turn away from sin. So as we pray, would you, would you let God wash every sin away? Father, I ask you today, God, touch the hearts of your people today, Lord. Lord, hear us today, God, as we cry out unto you, Lord. I know we're in church, Lord. We've got church people in here, Lord. But even in the church, sometimes, Lord, things creep into our lives. Even amongst your people, Lord, we find out, we read in the word that in the church, they lost track of what the word, the importance of the word was all about, Lord, in the house of God. Lord, let us to never forget and reverence you. Let us to never let things get aside, Lord. But I ask you today, Lord, in me, Lord, forgive me of every sin. Lord, I'm not the only one asking forgiveness today. God, forgive us, Lord. Lord, and help us to forgive ourselves. Lord Jesus, help use us, God. Use us mightily in your kingdom. And Lord, if someone has given you their life today for the first time, God, Lord, I ask you, Lord, let them to know how much you love them. Let them to know this is real. Lord, let them to feel your presence. Lord, for those that are coming back today, God, these that are just uh, renewing today, God, getting a new, fresh anointing, God, let them to feel your presence today, Lord, because you are so real and your word is alive. And I thank you today, Jesus, and I give you all praise in Jesus in your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to give you a few minutes to pray. If you feel the need to come to the altar, we would love to pray with you. You're welcome to come down. We'll pray. God has got everything you need.